KETV Newswatch 7, chronicling the stories impacting our community. Stories making a difference. Stories that matter to you. This is KETV Newswatch 7's Chronicle. Uh, the fact that there were no fatalities in, in this event is uh, uh, nothing short of a miracle. That's former Omaha Fire Chief Bernie Kanger talking about the Ems Pub explosion and fire last January. It was an obviously unexpected and devastating way to start the new year. And we are all hoping for the same outcome, and that is to save and rebuild the centerpiece of the old market. And that's exactly what's happening now, although who's to blame for the two alarm fire that gutted the Mercer building could take years to sort out. Well, good morning. This is KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. And this morning, we're talking with Omaha Mayor Gene Stothard about 2016. It's been an action-packed year, starting with that massive blaze in the old market. Well, then we got clobbered by several snowstorms, and the city struggled to clear the streets, especially January 20th. You remember this scene? It's when an Omaha police officer opted to shut down the westbound lanes at 90th and West Dodge in the middle of the day during the height of the storm. Well, social media had a heyday with the officer's action, especially after the mayor publicly criticized him on Facebook, saying, quote, I can't say the decision by that officer was something that was well thought out. Yesterday, when I heard Dodge Street was closed down, I did not know about it. Called Public Works, the street engineer did not know about it. And we called the command staff at police, and they didn't know about it. Rather than take responsibility for the response to the snowstorm and what the plows are doing, she's trying to take the blame and put it on the police officers for the terrible conditions on that street that led to its closure. And they're well within their discretion to close that street if it is a safety hazard, which it clearly was. A police officers association said it's not realistic to call the mayor every time they need to shut down lanes of traffic. The mayor said she thought it was time to review the city's snowplow plan, especially after learning it took two hours and 11 minutes for the plows to get there. So over the summer, the city developed a plan, unveiled it in October. The goal is to start plowing sooner when the next snow falls. New approach will put plows on residential streets when two inches of snow is on the ground. City used to wait for a four inch snow. Crews will also start pre-treating streets with brine 72 hours before an expected snowfall. And to help, there is a new 90,000-gallon tank to keep trucks supplied. Omaha also hired 16 new employees and has some new snow plows as well. Okay, now joining me now to talk about snow removal and other issues the city's dealt with this year is Omaha Mayor Gene Stothard. Mayor, thanks very much for joining us thanks today. Thanks for having me. Good morning. Yeah, good morning as well. And we've had a couple of snow events, small ones though. We haven't really had to get all the plows out yet, but have you that had any, any chance? What's your expectation for the plan? My expectation is we will do a lot better job this year. You know, if any mayor anywhere in the country says that they can't improve, they're wrong. So we're always looking at ways to provide better customer service and snow is included in that too. We did have a bad storm January in the, the end of January that you mentioned. Um, it was during rush hour, and that is a mayor's nightmare, a snowstorm <laughs> during rush hour. But we had a snow event, a large one after that, not long after that. We had made a lot of improvements in a very short window of time, and the response we got was very, very positive. So I knew with just some changes that with what our, our old procedure was is that we could make a lot of improvements. But before we did that, I really wanted to solicit the taxpayers, the citizens of Omaha, and see what their expectations were. I didn't want it just to just be my expectations or my plan. I wanted it to be the citizens. So we hired a consultant. We um, set surveys out. We let people do the survey online. We compiled the data, and as a result of that, we have made quite a few changes from what our, our procedure was before, including hiring 16 more people in the Public Works Department, which you already mentioned. We also uh, already bought 14 more single-axle trucks that are plows. Um, we bought a new 90,000-gallon tank to make our brine, which we make ourselves, which is just a sodium chloride solution. But we also have equipped, equipped more trucks with brine than we had before. And like you said, we're, we're going to start treating with brine, pre-treating 72 hours now, because we have learned, unless it's raining, it's just as effective 72 than 36 with our old procedure. And with the snow that we had the other day, we had a, a light dusting, but we had the city plows, because only the city plows 
can spread the brine. The, the uh, contractors that we hire for the mm -hmm. residential are only for plowing. So the city trucks were out. They were in the neighborhoods on the secondaries and the majors, and they were pre-treating. They weren't plowing, but they were pre-treating because we want to be ready for right. any event. And the important thing is, too, you need to be flexible during an event because sometimes things change quickly. If you recall last Christmas Eve, we were supposed to get a dusting, and we got about eight inches of snow. So we need to not only have a better plan, we need to be able to adjust that plan quickly during the event. And we are ready now. And we also opened up a new uh, street maintenance yard on 18th and Jane. And so we've done that in the past year, and that is really going to help the service in the eastern portion of the city. So we've made a lot of changes based on the feedback we got and feedback from the experts, and hopefully our snow plan will be much more satisfactory to the citizens. Okay, well, the snow plan, you know, as, as we're going along and we get snow, we, we've seen, and so hopefully it will continue to work out. Yes. I want to ask you about, you know, we've seen some, uh, about the contractors you mentioned. Yes. Um, is there a shortage there still? Are you confident we'll have enough contractors? Well, we practically, I think all but one this year, to my recollection, hire everyone that applies. We started doing that when I was on the city council. Every year we have hired more. Um, last year was 17. This year we're going to hire 21. So that's we keep on trying to increase that. But the important thing that we learned from the surveys, too, is even though those, those residential contractors are out there, we just don't tell them to plow and then don't pay attention to them. We send inspectors out to inspect the job they did. Mm -hmm. And we've almost doubled the number of inspectors, too. So we not only have more plowing residentials, but we have more people going out inspecting the jobs that they do. Because it's only the city plows that are the big orange trucks that really right. have the big wide blades. Some of those residential contractors we hire have smaller trucks and smaller blades, and we want to make sure they're doing a good job. The residential areas, though, our plan is, and one of the things we ask the citizens, is our old plan was, is it okay to have it passable within 24 hours? And the majors were curb to curb down to the bare pavement within six hours. And we typically, in the past, started applying the residentials with four inches, mm -hmm. and we're changing that. The this two. year, we're going to do two inches. Right. I want to ask you about uh, the uh, back of the old market we were talking about. Yes. This. What's the status there now as far as the streets are open, but the oh, rebirth? Yes, 11th and Howard are both open now. Mm -hmm. We really had to keep um, part of it closed for a while while they were doing the construction. Mm -hmm. But right now, I would call it a vanilla box ready. You know, it's the walls are shored up, the windows are in, the floors are back in, and it is ready for somebody, for shops or restaurants or businesses to come back in right now and develop. So um, it's been a long process. Um, you know, it was stalled a little bit with some uh, lawsuits that were right. filed, but the city of Omaha really worked with the developers and the owners to really get that going as quick as possible. We really wanted it opened up before the Christmas season, and it is. And so I think that you're going to see a, a lot more activity in that area, and hopefully we will see that building fill up again with tenants. Right, hopefully. And that fire was so rough. And speaking of fire, I mean, we've been, what, 10 months or so with, uh, without a fire chief uh, uh, named. What's the status there? Well, we have an interim fire chief, right. Chief Olson, who yep. is doing a great doing job. A great job. Yep. Um, we did a national search mm -hmm. for a new fire chief. Um, by city ordinance, I can only interview the top four. And so they go through an entire testing process. Mm -hmm. We use an outside agency that does the testing. In fact, there's one portion of the testing that it is a panel of fire chiefs from all over the country. So there's a different uh, stages of that testing process. I was given the top four to interview. There was two from the outside and two internal. Um, one from the outside dropped out already. Right. So then I was able to move the number fifth position into mm -hmm. that. I can reject any of those for a, a job-related issue, um, but so far we have just finished the top four, and now we're in discussions of what we're going to do or who we're going to choose. Mm -hmm. My goal is to have a new fire chief chosen by the end of the year, which is just in a few weeks. Okay. But I will say Chief Olson has done a fantastic job as the interim That's chief. True. Sure. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you about garbage collection. Yeah, we, we have a, a pilot project underway. Yes. Um, how is, have you gotten any feedback yet? Yes, we and have, it and it's been relative, I mean, most of it has been very positive. Mm -hmm. The main things that we have been um, questioned about is the size of the covered bins, which are 96-gallon 96 96 bins. Huh? Some people aren't used to them. They are big. They are a lot bulkier, 
but we really felt like what a better way to test what we're talking about and no decisions have been made. Mm -hmm. We may not use 96 gallon bins. That might be a 32 gallon bin, oh. but we really wanted to get out there and try it with our citizens and let them give us the feedback. So we picked 2,500 households in all five bands of the city. Mm -hmm. We have a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday band. So there's somebody in each band, and it's a fully automated truck. Right. And so they are coming up and picking up uh, the, the solid waste, yard waste, and the recyclables. We're going to test it for six months. It's at no charge at all to the citizens or to the city. Waste management is paying for this on their own. And then we're going to evaluate. But the feedback we have gotten, very few criticisms so far, and most of them just have been about the size of the container. And also when we had a lot of yard waste, they um, they weren't clear on how much yard waste they could put out, but once we let them know they could put six additional bags out, most people were just fine with that. Um, we haven't developed a, an RFP yet, but our current contract goes through 2020 was with waste management. I got tongue tied there, right. and they have agreed to let us out of the current contract before that because they would like to bid on a newer, more modernized system. Gotcha. Okay. So hopefully, we will get a lot of people bidding on it. RFP, for those of you who don't know, that's a request for a proposal in, right. in the contract, in the bidding process. Hey, one last thing briefly before we go to break. Um, HDR decided yes. not to have their headquarters mm -hmm. downtown, mm -hmm. but they stayed in the city. Do you see that as a win in light of what ConAgra did? I, well, I absolutely do because we want HDR here. They're mm -hmm. a worldwide company. They could build anywhere in the world. We wanted them downtown because a vibrant downtown is what makes one city different from another. Sure. And it really is defined in our downtown master plan, so we really wanted them downtown. We wanted to work with them to get them downtown. It didn't work out, but in the end, we are glad they are still in Omaha. And Exarban Village is growing and vibrant, and we're glad that they're there. Now, ConAgra, it's, it's important to remember, the national headquarters right. moved out. ConAgra is still here in Omaha, and there's over 1,200 great ConAgra employees still on that campus downtown, yep. and they still occupy three of the five buildings. And I have a number of friends who work there, yes. and so they, they say the same thing. Yes. Remember, we haven't all left. No, so. they are still yeah. here, yeah. and they will still be here. Yeah. And it's time for us to take a quick break, but up next, we're going to talk development along the riverfront and, and more, more, much more when KATV News Watch 7's Chronicle continues. When you're watching KTV News Watch 7's Chronicle, after two failed businesses, City of Omaha demolishes what used to be the store's trophy room. Now the building's gone. City's working with an engineer to see what they can and can't build on the riverfront. Possibilities include multiple restaurants, sand volleyball, a destination playground. We're looking at, uh, at multi-use and having, trying to activate that area in the wintertime also. So finding the right mix of both summer and winter activities. There are a few restrictions, including an environmental cap, limiting how tall buildings can be there because it's close to the flight path of Epley. And joining me this morning, talking riverfront and more, is Omaha Mayor Gene Stothard. Mayor, so what are you looking at for the riverfront? Well, right now, we first of all, stores is down, and we've mm -hmm. cleaned up the site, but we don't want to leave it empty down there. Right. And so I do have a committee um, uh, led by a lot of our business community and philanthropic community that have done a lot of work. In fact, there's another meeting tomorrow and another meeting on Monday, and we are really looking at what we could do down there to make it a destination year-round. Now, we did do a study. Lamp Renierson did a study and really looked at the, it's a former Superfund site, so really looked at what we could do there because not only is it the height of the building but you can't drill pylons or things and in, in, um, go through the environmental cap down sure. there. You also have a flood wall down there. You have a marina down there. So there, there's a lot of things you have to work with the Army Corps of Engineers. So there's a lot of things you have to look at of what could be down there. But we have, um, we're, we're developing a plan. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of good ideas. We know that there will be a, some sort of a structure that will be able to have multiple restaurants or at least more than one in there. We know that there's going to be things for kids down there. So we mentioned a destination playground, not just a playground, a normal playground, but something that is just really fantastic that has a theme, probably something to do with our history or the river. We're looking at the possibility of museums down there. We're looking at a lot of uh, like of a, a permanent pavilion down there for concerts and things. So there's a lot of ideas that we could do there. We're really looking at the area that the city owns, which is from the Bob Carey Bridge all the way down to Heartland of America Park. Right. So it's not just Lewis and Clark Landing that we're okay. looking at. So it's a strip of land that we own. That's what we're looking at okay. now. But we will come up with a lot of good ideas, and we hope we can announce something soon 
although it may take a while to build it, we, and not a long time, we're, well, I'm saying sure. over a year, but we hope we can announce a plan sometime soon. Okay, I want to also ask you about the food truck debate. Yes. I mean, it's we've gone to an agreement now where they have to pay the restaurant tax. Yes. There are other limitations. Are you pleased with where that all worked out? Yes, I am, because, you know, the restaurant tax is something that I did not support. It's an occupation tax. Um, I don't particularly like occupation taxes mm -hmm. because taxes should be broad-based and fair. That just targeted a certain industry. But as mayor, it is my job to make sure that all city ordinances are enforced and affor enforced fairly. And I felt like if the restaurants had to pay it, and they currently do, then the food trucks should also do it. When we passed, the, the city council passed the, the uh, restaurant tax ordinance, it just exempted food trucks. So basically all the city council had to do was to take that exemption out. The other thing we created that was new was a food truck ordinance because mm -hmm. we didn't have a food truck ordinance before and that more set up the regulations for how the food trucks would operate. But they're a very important part of the community now and in all fairness they were ready to pay it. In fact they, re they asked to pay for it because they felt like it was fair to all the brick and mortar restaurants too. So they were willing to do it. Well, let me ask you about the restaurant tax. I've asked you before and I'll ask you again. Sure. Uh, now, uh, you mentioned that you were against at the beginning. Right. You ran went for mayor that you were against the restaurant tax. I understand your argument that it can't go away completely. We're talking mm -hmm. 31 million they're going to city's going to pull in mm -hmm. this year uh, estimated. Why not at least reduce it? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, what, what I, what, one of the things I really said when I ran was I wasn't going to increase taxes, and I said I want to reduce the tax burden. And I said including the restaurant tax. Right, and so basically you're against it then. Right, and I, was, I made it very clear that I was mm -hmm. against it when I voted against it because, again, taxes need to be broad-based and they need to be fair. Right. Now, since then, I have done a lot with getting the budget under control, but there was a lot of things we needed to do, too, like adding 56 more police officers and sure. 15 more firefighters and the things we're doing with public works. But I still felt like that my promise was I was going to get the budget under control, which we did. Mm -hmm. We've had a surplus every single year since I've been mayor. We're going to have a surplus this year. So then why not reduce it? Well, up to uh, 43 million in surplus this year. I made the decision, and I still think it's a right decision. I made the decision to two times reduce property tax over the restaurant tax, and here okay. is why. Because everybody that has a business or property or a homeowner in Omaha pays the property taxes. Uh, the uh, restaurant tax is discretionary, and it is estimated that 30% of the restaurant tax comes from out-of-town visitors. I felt like that the tax reduction that would best benefit the citizens and businesses of Omaha would be property tax. If I hear something consistently every day, I hear, keep me safe, fix the roads, and lower my property taxes. That's what I hear the most. So that's what I responded to. So we've done two 2% 2 property tax rate reduction since I have been mayor. First one was the first one in 14 years. So we've really felt like we delivered on lowering that tax burden. Now the restaurant tax is still on the table, but I felt like the property tax rate reduction was the most important one to do in the first four years. Yes, we could inch it down from the 2% property tax rate reduction, for instance, that we did one year, I could have taken the restaurant tax from two and a half to two and a quarter percent. Okay. I didn't think that two and a quarter percent was going to make that much impact to the citizens where the property tax could. All right. Very good. And we're going to, we'll be right back with some final thoughts. You're watching KATV News Watch 7's Chronicle. Welcome back to KATV News Watch 7's Chronicle. We've been talking with Omaha Mayor Jean Stothard. Now, in September, she was out for a few days when she fell while walking her dogs, fractured a vertebrae in her back, hospitalized for a couple of days. Fortunately, did not need surgery, actually returned to work a week later. And joining us is Omaha Mayor Gene Stothard. So I have to ask you, how are you feeling? Really good, really good. It's amazing. It has not even been three months. Right. Originally, my neurosurgeon at the Med Center said I wouldn't go back to work full time for three months. And I went back in one week. Um, <laughs> I chose not to have surgery. It was L1. It was a burst fracture. So it was kind of, it was crushed. Right. And there were some bone fragments that came off. It was quite painful at first. I wore a back brace for about seven weeks. 
Now the back brace is off. Of course, when you take a back brace off, you're weak and stiff and sore. And now I'm in physical therapy, building it back up again. But and you're not quite as tall as you were, is that right? That's what they say. They say I'm about <laughs> a half an inch to an inch shorter. But when you're six feet tall, who notices? That's true. But I'm fine. I, it's amazing how quickly this has this has healed. So I'm um, boy, I'm very fortunate. And you're looking ahead. I mean, you you past few weeks you reached out to millennials. Yes. Uh, you've said you want to create an advisory board I of do. young Omahas. Yes. Explain that. Because I, well, I'm always trying to reach out to different portions of our community, mm -hmm. you know, because they're all important to me. I'm the mayor for everyone. I'm also creating a, a GBLTQ right. advisory. But the millennials, you know, we, we are doing a lot. We work with the chamber. The chamber does economic development for us. Um, they, you know, I think the startup companies, the chamber has the Omaha Collaborative um, uh, startup over mm -hmm. on in the AIM building right across the street from City Hall now. This portion of our community is very important and they're growing. Omaha is very attractive to millennials. You know, we're always on these top 10 or top 20 list. And one of them that we have been on is a city that millennials are moving back to because we have what they're looking for. You know, we're real, we are really care about the startups and the accelerators that, that have been going on in Omaha. Mm -hmm. We have a low cost of living. We have, um, you know, our, our apartments are available in the urban core. There's a lot that are very, very attractive. And we want to be good partners with everyone. And so I've reached out to that community. I had a round table with them. More not for me to talk, but to listen to them. You know, what do we knew, need to do mm -hmm. um, with, with the startups, with the millennial population, with the things that are important to them? I needed them to talk to me. And so with that, we came up with the concept of, of creating a millennial, a millennial advisory board. Right. I can do that by an executive order, and we're drafting it right now. There's a lot of people interested saying, I want to be part of this. But it is just a way to give that group a voice and be heard. Gotcha. And so that will be created really soon. Like I said, there's a lot of interest in it. I, uh, you know, Half of my staff that I have in my office are millennials. And so, you know, I have 16 staff members and half, more than half of them are millennials. So I really value mm -hmm. that age group, uh, you know, that's typically 18 to 35. And so we're, we're reaching out to see what we can do to make it even more attractive in Omaha. You get an earful all day long then from them, I imagine. So. Well, uh, you know, uh, that's good, though. I yeah. love to solicit input sure. from everybody in Omaha. And these are things that, that we can only work together on to make it better. I value partnerships. We have tons of partnerships that we've created in the last three and a half years, whether it's the business community, whether it's community groups, um, a lot of different partnerships that are just making Omaha better. This is an example of another one. Very good. All right. Mayor Stoddard, thanks very much for joining us this morning. We're running out of time. It always goes so quickly. With yes, it. it does. Yeah, best of luck. Uh, happy holidays to you Thank as well. Thank you. Happy holidays to you too. Appreciate that. Should mention that Mayor Stoddard is running for re-election. Also in the race, Democrat Heath Mello and Republican Taylor Royal. And as we get closer to the primary election, which is the first Tuesday in April, we will invite Mayor Stoddard and the other candidates to appear on this show spend 30 minutes with us talking about their campaigns. And remember, if you missed any part of this show, you want to watch it again, it's online right now at KETV.com. If you don't see it there, when you look, just Google Mayor Stothert and the word Chronicle. I'm Rob McCartney. Thanks for watching. We'll see you back here again next Sunday morning for KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle.